Uh, okay, our next speaker uh, is uh, Professor Jason Rohr from University of Notre Dame. He is the, uh, is it the Gala Family Professor and Chair of the Department of Biomedic Biological Sciences at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, and we are going to hear him talking about clinical trials in Africa to enhance uh, health, improve sustainability, and reduce poverty. Thank you for coming. We're looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. So humanity faces no greater challenge than addressing the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs. Now, traditionally, the 17 SDGs have been studied individually, uh, typically through a single disciplinary lens. Now, this is despite considerable evidence that they intersect in many ways to contribute to poverty the first SDG. Let me give you an example. So marginalized communities in low and middle income countries regularly experience simultaneous disease, food, energy, and water challenges. And they all jointly mire them in poverty traps. So today I'm gonna to argue that there must be a paradigm shift in how science is conducted as well as translated to make transformative progress towards achieving the SDGs. So rather than taking the traditional siloed approach that I showed on the previous slide, we must embrace the interconnections through a systems-based approach and develop truly interdisciplinary teams that search for sustainable, scalable, win-win planetary health solutions for multiple SDGs to navigate our planet back towards a safe operating space. So here is the amazing uh, planetary health team that I had the privilege to work with on this project. They really deserve all the credit, much more credit than me. Uh, it's been an absolute privilege and honor to work with this group. So today I'm gonna provide you with an example of how we discovered and tested a win-win planetary health solution in Senegal, shown here in Western Africa. And in Senegal, we addressed uh, several planetary boundaries. In fact, we had uh, addressed five of the nine planetary uh, boundaries that are highlighted on this slide. So we addressed climate change, biosphere integrity, land system change, freshwater change, and biochemical flows of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. And our research question was, can we reduce disease by removing invasive aquatic vegetation that serves as the habitat for parasites that cause human schistosomiasis and offer environmental and societal co-benefits by converting this nuisance vegetation into a private good for these communities. So schistosomiasis, what is it? So it's the second most debilitating parasitic disease globally behind malaria. Most infections are in sub-Saharan Africa, and it is a major disease burden in children. The parasite is released from snails, which is shown in this video. All those little things swimming in the water are uh, the infectious stage for humans. Those uh, cercariae uh, swim through the water and they penetrate the skin of the human host. Those parasites move through the bloodstream. Uh, they reproduce sexually in the human host. They actually mate for life. Um, and uh, those eggs that are released by the female worms are released in either urine or feces of the human host, depending on the species of the parasite. And that is how they return back to the water where they came from. So among its many symptoms, uh, schistosomiasis can stunt growth in children, uh, as well as uh, their intellectual development. It can uh, cause loss of liver, intestinal, and bladder function, and unfortunately, even death. All right, so let's get to the hypotheses. So what we hypothesized was that agricultural development around these communities in Africa would increase fertilizer inputs into water bodies, which would promote the proliferation of submerged and invasive aquatic vegetation, shown here, that serves as the habitat for the intermediate hosts, the snails, as well as the parasites. And with more snails and more parasites, we predicted greater schistosomiasis in the children. So we tested this hypothesis in uh, 23 communities, quantifying the variables uh, shown on this slide. 
All right, so what did we find? So uh, we showed that total crop cover here was uh, correlated positively with uh, prevalence of this disease uh, in school children. The more crop area, the more fertilizer used, the more fertilizer, the more of the vegetation that serves as the habitat. And we did a full blown path analysis shown on the bottom here. And the basic take home message is that we found strong support for our hypothesized pathways. Okay, well, given that the fertilizer runoff was being captured in this invasive aquatic vegetation and was increasing schistosomiasis, we wanted to develop an intervention. So we hypothesized that removing the vegetation and converting it to compost, livestock feed, or fuel for biodigesters would return the nutrients back to agriculture, in increase food, energy, and incomes, and reduce disease, pollution, and climate change. So basically, this is just a giant recycling project. We're taking the nutrients from the agricultural fields that are running off into these water bodies, fueling disease, reducing health, and we're taking the nutrients captured in that vegetation and we're putting it back on the agricultural fields in a manner that provides a private good for these communities. All right, so to test this hypothesis, we first gathered baseline data on schistosomiasis uh, infections in school children, snail and aquatic uh, plant abundances in these communities, and water quality in the 16 communities that we recruited to a cluster randomized uh, control trial where we had before and after data, difference in difference uh, approach to this uh, analysis. So in eight of the villages, the submerged invasive aquatic vegetation was removed quarterly every three months, and eight villages were left as unmanipulated controls. All of the children had their schistosoma infections treated with the drug Praziquantal, and we tracked reinfection rates in these school children. And importantly, we also tracked the amount of effort uh, it took to remove the vegetation so we could use that as an input into our economic models to evaluate the costs and benefits of this innovation. All right, I know everyone's got short attention spans. You've heard me long enough. I'm gonna let you watch a 90 second video on my results. Every year by schistosomiasis, a disease that lives in the waterways of developing countries. Today, 200 million people are infected and over 700 million more are at risk. Treatment is unavailable to most of them. And even then it's a short term solution. Snails that transmit this disease live in freshwater vegetation that chokes out water access points. The snails release thousands of parasites which enter human hosts through contact with water. Removing the vegetation reduces disease rates among children while increasing open water access for villagers. This has resulted in a 103-fold reduction in snails. We map water access points with drones and satellite images to identify where the vegetation grows. This can facilitate the scaling up of our public health action by targeting schistosomiasis hotspots for ministries of health. We are testing the cost effectiveness of using harvested vegetation as compost, livestock feed, or fuel for biodigesters that provide gas for cooking and electricity production. The compost has significantly increased crop yields. Villagers are taught methods to sustain this process, meaning this solution has the potential to address water, energy, and food issues, and save lives well into the future. Every time I watch this video, I feel a tremendous uh, sense of gratitude and like to thank uh, the communities that we work with. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, it's community based participatory research. And so to the warm and welcoming people of Senegal, thank you for so generously supporting us on this uh, journey together. All right, so we are uh, predominantly scientists in this room, so you probably want to see some of the data. So we'll uh, sort of walk you through uh, what we found. So uh, one of the key findings uh, from this clinical trial was that uh, the control sites 
uh, had 1.46 times higher schistosoma mansoni infections and lower open water access uh, than the removal sites. And the open water access is important. Uh, many of these communities use these water access points to get water to wash their clothes, to get water for irrigation. And if the vegetation makes it challenging to get in there and access the water, um, that can have an impact on their lives. Additionally, so let me just show you here that the more vegetation we remove, the more snails we remove, to sort of supporting uh, that this is their habitat, and these are the results um, of the uh, uh, difference in difference uh, analyses. Importantly, uh, there were no effects on water chemistry or quality or biodiversity. Uh, we had to actually remove this vegetation every three months in most cases, so there is evidence of recovery. There are pros and cons to that, uh, but that, that was the case. As the video showed, uh, we converted uh, the vegetation into compost, whoops, uh, which is shown here. So this is the vegetation, that's the compost. Uh, we crossed the uh, compost additions uh, with either fertilizer additions or tilling, and we did the trials on pepper and onion, uh, rec recruiting uh, farmers in these villages to participate in these trials. And uh, importantly, uh, the compost increased both onion and pepper production independent of whether those plots got fertilizer or whether the compost was tilled, uh, which was exciting, as you can see here on the slide. And this is likely because uh, the compost increased the water holding capacity of the soil. So we work uh, just south of the Saharan Desert near the uh, border of Senegal and Mauritania. Soils are very dry, it's very arid, there's not a lot of organic material and we believe that's the major contribution here. Importantly, as I mentioned, we quantified the effort to remove this vegetation and incorporated economists as well, there, as, well as many other scientists in this project. And the economists uh, on the project demonstrated that the benefits of this uh, innovation uh, with the compost alone were nine times the costs. Uh, so uh, according to those folks, that's a big uh, benefit to cost ratio. What was really amazing is that we would be pulling the vegetation out of these water access points, you know, with our hands and pitchforks, and there would be uh, cattle and sheep and donkeys in the landscape that would start coming in and voluntarily feeding on it. Um, and, and this really emphasizes the importance of boots on the ground interactions with the communities, with these ecosystems to understand how they're functioning to generate innovations uh, that are supported by those observations. And this was one of the ones we had. So we um, pulled together this fantastic livestock team. My postdoc also was involved uh, in this team. And we actually tested whether converting the vegetation into livestock feed and substituting it for traditional feed would be another source of income for these communities. So what did we do? We, we dried the vegetation first to make sure that we killed any parasites uh, in that vegetation. And then we reconstituted it with water and we isocalorically substituted it for the traditional livestock feed. And we fed it to both juvenile and adult sheep, as you can see here in these trials. And so uh, the vegetation maintained both juvenile and adult sheep weights up to uh, the 60% substitution, which was the maximum level that we tested. These lines are flat lines, so they maintained their weight. But importantly, the economists that we pulled into the project uh, demonstrated that this uh, vegetation was 41 up to 179 times cheaper than the traditional livestock feed. So we didn't stop there. Uh, we also did trials where we combined uh, cow manure with this vegetation and biodigesters, and we showed that this combination increased the quality of cooking gas relative to either addition alone. And we are now leveraging a $60,000 biodigester investment in Senegal by the Swiss government for carbon credits. And so the goal of this uh, use of the vegetation is to combat climate change by reducing methane emissions from the cow manure, as well as deforestation uh, associated with collecting firewood as cooking fuel. About 80% of the cooking fuel in Senegal is uh, firewood. And so uh, we're excited about not only the health benefits, but also the climate change benefits. Okay, what about scaling? So to help scale our innovation, we coupled drone imagery shown here and here 
with satellite imagery to identify potential hotspots uh, for schistosomiasis so that we could target this innovation. And the remote sensing techniques were, are working quite effectively at identifying the submerged aquatic habitat for the snails. Uh, this here is the uh, submerged vegetation and you can see how well it pops in fuchsia uh, in our remote sensing models. Okay. So in summary, we provide economic incentives to facilitate sustainable development and return nutrients back to agriculture, closing nutrient loops, while simultaneously helping marginalized communities escape disease poverty traps, improve food, water, and energy access, and mitigate climate change, all while providing viable approaches to scale this innovation. Some other things uh, I'd like to highlight, uh, I just want to re-emphasize the engagement that we have uh, with the communities. I, I think this work would not be successful or not for that, those interactions. I also want to emphasize that this is, I think, is a, a, a rare case uh, where we have sustainable development that is not in conflict with wealth, health, food, energy, and water. So there are those solutions out there. We just got to look for them. And finally, I think uh, this work also highlights convergent science. We got together not only uh, the medical doctors that did the testing and the drug administration, myself uh, as a disease ecologist, we got sociologists involved, economists, veterinarians to help with our livestock trials, agricultural scientists. And so convergent science and interdisciplinary work, uh, I think is uh, something that I'd like to highlight uh, from this project. Okay, so what are our next steps? Uh, you're probably wondering. We are continuing to hone our remote sensing techniques so that we can better target uh, this work throughout Western Africa and other parts of the world. We have uh, currently a 116 uh, village cluster randomized trial uh, that is active. We're at the midline point uh, right now in Senegal. And there are four treatment arms uh, to that trial. One treatment arm is that none of these communities are getting any education on this innovation as a control. Another treatment arm is that a quarter of these communities are receiving education on the public benefits. So this is the uh, reduced schistosomiasis risk and uh, increased open water access. Another arm is receiving education on just the private benefits, which is the increased income, food, energy, uh, and uh, livestock feed elements of the project. And then the last arm is getting uh, education and training, uh, extension education and training on both the public and private benefits so that we can evaluate whether there is the possibility of a synergism that uh, facilitates the voluntary removal of this vegetation and also the increase in health, uh, food, energy, and water. We're not only tracking infection rates, snails, vegetation, uh, we're also tracking uh, educational attainment in the, in the school children. Uh, that's an addition. We're uh, conducting sociological surveys to look at uh, poverty alleviation and income. And so there's a lot of additions uh, that I'm hoping that we'll have uh, at a future point. We're also testing our innovation in other parts of Africa. We have preliminary trials uh, on, in Kisumu on Lake Victoria in Kenya to evaluate whether we may be able to begin uh, work there to uh, see whether we have similar benefits of this vegetation removal and, uh, and schistosomiasis and poverty alleviation in East Africa. Finally, uh, we're working with some civil engineering companies uh, in Senegal to generate corporate scaling approaches to this as an alternative. So a lot of civil engineering companies have um, backhoes and other mechanized equipment to mechanically remove the vegetation that is not being used 24-7. And so we are working with some um, business professors at, at Cornell and economists there to develop a business plan. Uh, the idea is that we would educate uh, these entrepreneurs to have a second use for, of their mechanized equipment that would provide a secondary profit stream. They would remove the vegetation providing the public health benefit. And we would train them to use our remote sensing technology to track regrowth of the vegetation in real time. So that way they only return back to these sites when it's profitable 
and and uh, when there is public health risk. So we'll hope hopefully one of these two approaches, the voluntary removal or the commercially based scaling, will work. So in conclusion, uh, to make transformative progress towards returning to a safe operating space, there must be a paradigm shift from addressing the sustainable development goals individually to embracing the interconnections among the SDGs through a systems-based approach. And I want to also highlight that uh, we hope uh, that by presenting and spreading the word of our work that we can um, amplify our planetary health solution for addressing multiples SDGs, and most importantly, inspire the search for other win-win solutions to the many formidable codependent grand challenges that is facing humanity. So with that, I'd like to thank Indiana CTSI for supporting our work, Frontiers Planet Prize, NIH, and the National Science Foundation for funding, the fantastic colleagues uh, that worked on this project, as well as the people of Senegal. And if there's time, uh, I'd be happy to take questions. Uh, yeah, great example of the One Health um, concept application. Thank you. You started with your talk with the depiction of silos, scientific silos that we're all in. And I'm looking for the bunker busting munition to make happen what you made happen in this uh, presentation. How do you effectively connect very disparate scientific communities that need to work together on this, that don't even know that you know, the other domain exists, they don't know their yeah. vernacular, they don't know their meetings. And if you could say one word at the end about funding. So how do you get these multidisciplinary projects funded that don't have a logical home at the NIH, the NSF, or any other agency? Yeah, now great question, uh, and it's something we struggle with. I, I think uh, I'll start with by saying that impact, right? I don't think uh, to properly address the grand challenges that we face currently that we're going to have a great impact uh, staying in our silos. Uh, I think we need to not only come up with solutions, but we need to understand their costs and benefits. We need to know that communities are going to embrace those solutions. There's lots of examples in public health where solutions work and they're not actually adopted uh, by the communities that are targeted. So I, I would argue that impact should be uh, the primary motivation behind uh, interdisciplinary work. How to get it funded? Well. That's tough, that's challenging. I'm optimistic though. Um, we do a lot of work on climate change and health. Hopefully many of you have seen the uh, increased interest in the National Institutes of Health in climate change health interactions. Uh, there are lots and lots of examples and hopefully more to come where there are collaborations between NSF, NIH, and the US Department of Agriculture. A lot of this work was funded through the Ecology and Evolution of Infectious Diseases Program, which is a joint collaboration and jointly funded through NIH, NSF, and USDA. Our first tranche of money uh, was funded uh, by EEID through NIH, and our second tranche has been through NSF. I can't tell you why, um, but it's all been on the schistosomiasis work. So I think there are opportunities out there. I think they're growing. I think there's also opportunities through places like Bill and Melinda Gates, Chan Zuckerberg. There are some nonprofits. There's industry. And uh, I think we have to cobble it together and uh, make a more compelling argument for why convergence science is what we need in the future. Yep. Uh, go ahead, Sharon. So I would love to hear um, the, a little bit about your CTSI grant, in particular mm -hmm. how long ago it was, because a lot of what the CTSI does is actually that little bit in the beginning to help people yeah. move along, and this is a huge impact story. So I'd love to hear a little more of that. Yeah, so our, our CTSI grant uh, funded uh, a, a sl small piece of this. Uh, it was, um, it's all, it's, simultaneously looking at um, some discovery of genes in the snails that might provide resistance 
Uh, and so that sampling um, was uh, occurred at the same time as a lot of these trials. We were able to sort of co-opt the work that we had already had funded uh, to do the sampling and uh, explore some of that. That's sort of uh, still in, in the pro process of getting finalized and funded, or uh, um, published and, and analyzed. Um, and so it was, it was a separate uh, piece, but sort of leveraged uh, the work we already had going on. So uh, the, the paper we published in Nature was seven years of research before we finally told the whole story. And, and that's another thing that might be worth highlighting is that uh, if we, re we probably got to rethink our tenure models uh, because, uh, you know, convergence science takes time. Uh, and, and I could have, you know, chopped this up into pieces, uh, but I was at a point in my career where I wanted to wait and tell uh, a real complete story. And there's still a lot of science to be done, of course, but you know, I waited seven years uh, till we had what we felt like was a really complete story and a lot of junior faculty just can't afford that. Yeah. We do one, maybe one more question on, from online. We've got two from online. Okay. So if we could answer both of them, okay. that'd be awesome. Uh, the first question is what challenges regarding differing collaborations point of view came up and what strategies did you use to solve them? Yeah, great. So uh, what, what challenges did we have based on different points of view? Um, you know, I think I th we had actually fewer challenges based on points of view than we did challenges associated with doing work in, in Senegal in a low middle income country. I, if, if people haven't done, haven't done work in, in low uh, or middle income countries, it's challenging, right? You have to bring everything with you. You can't like pick up the phone and call VWR and say, can I, you know, can I get this shipped overnight or or go to this, the, the corner and to the Walmart or the Target and grab what you need. And, uh, you know, there's also a tremendous number of language barriers. Everywhere you go, you have to have a driver and a translator and you got to work with the village chief and, and, and build those relationships and, and, and understand the culture. I think those are actually even bigger challenges than dealing with a bunch of disparate disciplines because um, you know, we're all working in the same space. We can all get on Zoom. We have good Wi-Fi, unlike a lot of my colleagues in Senegal who are dropping off calls left and right. Um, and so those issues, I think, were actually a lot easier to handle than the, the ones in, in Senegal. Cool. Thanks for that question, Nanette. Uh, the next question is from Julian, and it says, congratulations on this terrific example of a socium-directed intervention to improve health. Did you encounter regulatory challenges in Senegal, and how are you monitoring for downstream unanticipated effects of the intervention? Yeah, great question. So uh, yes, we dealt with regulatory issues. Um, so we have to coordinate very carefully with the Ministry of Health, so that way these communities do not get uh, prosequantal in the middle of our clinical trials. So we work very closely with the Ministry of Health and coordinate that. Uh, it took us uh, a year to get our drone permits, and that required um, uh, someone in Senegal showing up to the office every other day. So these are some of the challenges um, that, and you know, it's it's just the way things work. Uh, I, I wish they were more efficient, but they're not. Uh, it's some of the struggles that we dealt with, and it's a challenge doing work there. Some of the um, unanticipated consequences, we really worried that removing this vegetation and creating so much open water would make those uh, water access points more inviting to swimming. And if they swam more, they would have higher exposure uh, to uh, these parasites. And so we quantified uh, that sort of behavior. We didn't see any major uptick, but if there was a major increase in, in full uh, you know, body exposure to the water, that's, that would be counteracting the patterns uh, that we observed. We're also now in our 116 uh, village trial, we've incorporated additional villages up and downstream uh, from our villages so that we, we can determine whether there are any uh, sort of downstream consequences to our interventions. Uh, just in case uh, when you remove this amount of vegetation on a much larger spatial scale that we're worried that there might be some ecosystem level impact. So we are monitoring that now as well. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good.
Thank you, uh, Dr. That was fascinating. That actually took me back to the 80s uh, when I was doing ruminant nutrition research, and I was actually thinking, you know, this might be a place where those silos could be actually a good thing to store all that uh, vegetation, but uh, that might be a discussion over lunch we have. Uh,